Your textbook just entitles the introduction, introduction, but I've added here a brief history of environmental and resource economics to describe what the introduction really does. Many of the authors that we're going to talk about we've discussed before, but here you can see them in, in one group and it's easier to get an idea of the historical development of the field. The first author we talk about here is Thomas Robert Malthus, the dates here, 1798, are the dates that the book gives of an important work that they wrote. Malthus, as we saw before, discussed absolute scarcity and limits. His was the idea that population was growing, as he called it, geometrically, food supply only arithmetically, and so there were going to be, let's use a modern term, limits to growth which were going to limit the ability of an economy to grow in the future. Next we talked about, and, and here we discuss again, uh, David Ricardo, here the date is 1817, but again Ricardo and Malthus knew each other very well. Uh, Ricardo, the idea here of being relative scarcity, as we said before, Ricardo really wasn't interested in Malthus's question about the history of economic growth, his theory dealt with why different types of land earned different rents and how that influenced the price of food and the development of agriculture and agricultural production. But this basic idea that some there was some type of land that was had good soil and made production inexpensive and other kind of land had poor soil and made agricultural e production expensive this this idea of relative scarcity that can be also applied to natural resources and we talked about um, we talked about the McKelvey box diagram as an example of a Ricardian notion of relative scarcity. Now I have mentioned Marx a little bit before. Let's go into somewhat more detail here. Uh, Karl Marx. Marx's theory of history was called historical materialism. And in order to understand that, um, it's important to understand the idea of the Hegelian dialectic. So uh, Georg W. F. Hegel was a German uh, philosopher who was writing um, around the year 1800, so uh, just before Marx. And the uh, so-called Hegelian dialectic is the idea that in intellectual history there's an idea called the, th the thesis and then an opposing idea called the antithesis. And as history goes on, the, the thesis and the antithesis somehow get considered and debated and what ends up is a synthesis of, of, of these two things. Now, uh, l let me say this is a traditional interpretation of the of Hegel and the Hegelian dialectic. There are modern philosophers nowadays who think that's not the right way to interpret Hegel, but it does seem to be the way that Marx interpret interpreted Hegel. So Marx's idea of historical materialism is that let's let's start with some initial position. So like the Hegelian thesis, um, the initial position here would be primitive communism, by which Marx talked about let's say the economic arrangements of people who lived twenty thousand years ago or thirty thousand years ago, before there was settled agriculture, before there was any idea of a state. Uh, so primitive communism lasted a long time, but then technological progress occurred and there came to be uh, notions of other ways of organizing production, let's say settled agriculture, uh, which is a technological change. Also the development of metals is another technological change which made a primitive communism, which was m more hunting and, and gathering a kind of lifestyle, uh, less, let's use the word, efficient than an alternative. And so the, the thesis, primitive communism, um, came under a, a attack from these technological changes that were pushing people away from primitive communism. And the result was the so-called ancient mode of production, 
which reached e its um, apogee in the Roman Empire. I think the Roman Empire, I think the classical Chinese empires of around the same time, um, where, where which is totally different than primitive communism. You have an extremely powerful state, you have settled agriculture, you have very long distance trade, and so forth. But then the ancient mode of production uh, came into came under pressure. Now we know historically that was because of the barbarian invasions of the Roman Empire. Uh, but uh, and and here let's just talk about Europe because that's what Marx uh, was was really writing about. Um, but in any case, things changed. The ancient mode of production collapsed, and in Europe, the feudal mode of production <coughs> got started, and Marx's idea is of feudalism prospered for many centuries, but then there came to be new inventions, uh, for example, credit markets, that, and also the printing press, that made feudalism increasingly inefficient. And so feudalism, so you can think of it as being the thesis, came under attack by these new technologies and new ways of organizing business, and you ended up with a feudalism moving on to capitalism. And Marx said, uh, capitalism has been extremely successful for many centuries, but eventually it's going to come under pressure from technological changes, which are going to mean that the capitalist mode of production is not efficient anymore. And what's going to come after capitalism is communism. And there's lots of debate about whether you have a, an intermediate mode called socialism and what socialism is and what communism is. And Marx spent a whole bunch more time talking about feudalism and especially capitalism than communism because communism, of course, hasn't happened yet. And so Marx didn't have anything to analyze. So he didn't talk about it very much. Now, in terms of environmental economics, where am I going with this? You can see that the the limits that Marx talked about are limits due to the social organization of production. So primitive communism worked well, but then it, it constituted a limit, and so the ancient mode of production was more efficient and took over. That worked well until eventually technology changed, and then the ancient mode of production constituted a limit, and feudalism took over. Feudalism worked well until technological change occurred and then feudalism became an impediment to efficiency and it got overthrown by capitalism. And similarly the Marxist prediction is that capitalism works well for, I don't know, maybe 500, 700, 800 years and then it doesn't work so well anymore because of the technological changes and it'll get overthrown or replaced by a communism. So it's uh, so you have technological progress which in Marx's view I believe is the is the driving engine, it's the engine that drives history. And eventually the social organization of production, whatever it is, which used to be efficient, now becomes inefficient and constitutes a limit. And so the limits in particular are not natural or physical resource limits. And so at least to my way of reading Marx, uh, he wasn't at all interested in environmental limits to growth, resource limits to growth. He thought all the limits were were because of uh, a social mode of production which used to be a good thing to have, but now wasn't a good thing to have anymore. It wasn't an efficient thing to have. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about modern uh, socialists or, or communists. Uh, um, they vary in their opinions. Uh, certainly um, some of them agree with Marx that there are no natural or physical resource limits, or that, in other words, that uh, that things that appear to be uh, an environmental limit to growth are that's just an illusion caused by the fact that we now have to suffer under a capitalist system, and that if we had a more logical system, call it uh, let's say communism or socialism, uh, then you wouldn't have these limits anymore. Now it's interesting here to to as I write, to note the reversal in the 1960s of the Chinese Communist Party's population policy. So before the mid-1960s, the Chinese, Communists, or the China, Chinese Communist Party's position on population was that overpopulation 
was by definition a problem that could only occur in capitalist economies. And uh, after the Communist Revolution in 1949, uh, China wasn't a capitalist economy anymore, and so population could not per se be a problem because, uh, because all environmental and natural resource constraints only occur under capitalism, and so they disappear under communism. In the mid-1960s, the Chinese Communist Party as we say, did a 180, completely changed its mind, decided that there were natural and physical limits to growth, that uh, population growth completely unconstrained in China would lead to uh, a population that was going to be way too big, pressed too hard on uh, China's natural resource capacity, and so the Chinese Communist Party instituted this one-child-per-family policy which existed, um, which existed un until fairly recently, around, I don't know the date, 2015, 2016, uh, and even now there are limits. You can't have an unlimited, if you're a married couple in China, you can't have an unlimited number of children. Um, so uh, that, that's an example of both the older communist idea that <coughs> limits to growth are only a problem under capitalism, and a newer idea where uh, where uh, some people are who are communist or or um, or or sympathetic to Marxist ideas are also interested in environmental limits. Um, sometimes uh, people like that are called red green, so red is the traditional color of communism and green the traditional color of the environmental movement. So by red-green, we mean people who are both sympathetic to Marxism, but also sympathetic to the environmental movement and environmental limits to growth. Okay, uh, next uh, here, uh, John Stuart Mill. So in 1857, Mill wrote about the stationary state. And by the stationary state, he meant an economy that wasn't growing, that had a constant stock of human capital and physical capital. This gave rise, as we'll see, to 20th century and 21st century ideas about does the economy always have to grow? And, and what does growth really mean? Which we'll get to in, in a moment. N now, this idea of constant stock of human capital, uh, that's one way to phrase it. Another way to phrase it would be a constant stock of humans, and I think that's more what Mill was talking about. The, the question that immediately gets raised and harkens back to what the Chinese Communist Party did in terms of the one child per family policy is, well, how, how would you achieve a constant stock of humans uh, without having government regulation that would interfere with the liberty of married couples to have as many children as they want. And so it's interesting that Mill was not only an economist, he was also a very important political scientist in the sense of what's called now political theory, that is political philosophy. Uh, Mill wrote a book on liberty, which is one of the real founding texts of modern political uh, philosophy, a discussion of what is the appropriate role of government. I mean, certainly before before Mill, it used to be thought that kings were absolute and, and could do whatever they want and should be able to do whatever they want. But Mill, of course, was not thinking at all like that and wanted to, to think about essentially a philosophical foundation for democracies. And in Mill's book on liberty, he talks about what kinds of, what does liberty mean? Um, what kinds of things, what does it mean to be a free person? Uh, what kind of things should government be able to do and not be able to do in a democracy? And so in some sense, uh, Mill wrote the basic definitions of what we mean by political liberty and political freedom. And it's very interesting that Mill thought that the size of a married couple's family was a legitimate interest of the government, of the state. 
because the size of your family affects other people. And so Mill thought that it didn't violate his definition of liberty for the government to put population controls on, uh, on people. I think I'll pause here and we'll start with the 20th century in the next video.